Our story is about a villain. Wait, our story is about a medieval villain. The word was spelled V-I-L-L-E-I-N in those days. And it was a word that was neither booed nor hissed. In fact, a villain wasn't a villain at all. He was just a peasant, a serf, living on the land of some lord or gentleman. Then the villain or the serf got tired of being more or less a slave and revolted. It was then that the word took on its shady implications. That's the story we tell this week in We Came This Way. The NBC University of the Air presents We Came This Way a new historical series for our listeners at home and abroad. With John W. Van de Cook as the narrator, we present Chapter 2, a story of the revolt of the peasants in We Came This Way. Some say the revolt began this way with a girl singing in her father's kitchen on a morning in spring. John Legsman, come to collect the head tax from all defaulters. Oh, but we're not defaulters. My father paid. He said the head tax was unjust, but he paid. He did not pay for you. Why? Because the tax was levied only on men and women. Don't you see? I'm not a woman yet. <laughs> I see nothing of the sort. But I'm not a woman. I'm not. As for that, we shall soon find out. No, no. Let me go. Father, father. Keep still, girl. Father. Keep still. the story goes. Fact or legend, we do not know. But we do know that neither the attack on the Tyler's daughter, nor even the hateful head tax itself, was the sole cause of the rebellion. To understand why, after centuries of dumb suffering, the peasants of England should suddenly have found a voice on a spring day in 1381, we must understand what England of that day was like. Let's go back a bit. It is a country held fast in the grip of feudalism. Its wealth is in land, and the land is owned by the church, the king, the nobles, the landed gentry, and a few freeholders. The serf owns nothing but maybe an ox. And upon his death, his lord has the right to demand even the ox, has the right to demand that the widow marry a man of the lord's choosing. No wonder the serf, shivering in his rags, should look up from the furrow and ponder as his lord rides by, warm in his ermine, should look up from his black bread and beans. Eat your beans. They grow cold while you stare at nothing. I was thinking of the feasting at the castle tonight. Rich soup made of eels. Soul brought up from the ocean. Fried almonds. And boar's head larded with sauce. Beef, mutton, pork, swan. Oh, eat your beans. And figs, dates, grapes, filbert nuts, and wine. Spiced wine. Eat your beans. Why should I eat beans? Because God made some men lords and some serfs. Then God should have made the serf like an ox, not given him a mind to question with.
It is a time for asking questions. And lots of men are asking them. There's Long Will Langlin, for one, the monk who wrote that poem about Piers the Plowman. For some of the best are born rich, and some are beggars and poor folk. For we are all Christ's creatures, and by his coffers are we wealthy, and brothers of one blood, beggars and nobles. And there's Wycliffe, the great priest and scholar, asking questions down at Oxford. Why should the Lord strive with their tenants to bring them in greater thraldom against all reason and charity? And at the same time he's asking questions, they say this Wycliffe is putting the Bible into English so the common people can read for themselves the answers the poor carpenter of Nazareth had for things. And here's John Ball, that other priest, always in and out of jail these days for the question he puts into rhyme. When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? That's a question for you. And there is much else that needs answering. The Black Death has reduced the population by a half, and the laborers that are left are able to demand more for their hire because of the shortage. But the King and Parliament are determined that nothing shall be changed, so they've put through the statute of laborers that freezes wages and serfdom at pre-plague levels. The prisoner will now stand forth for sentence. Jack Straw, sir. Because you did offer yourself at reaping time for sixpence a day, and at the same time did make various congregations of laborers in different places, and counsel them not to take less than sixpence for a day's work, I sentence you to be branded with hot irons and lie a 12 month in Maidstone jail. The sentence is unjust. Water in the court. The rogue in the back of the court who's seen fit to question His Majesty's justice will stand forth. Your name? What the Tyler? Freeman, my lord. At least I was a freeman until this evil statute of laborers was passed. Now I'm little better than a slave. What talk is this? Slave talk, my lord. Since the serf Jack Straw is forbid to speak in court, I'll speak for it. I forbid you. I'll have my say or bite out my tongue, my lord. If something isn't done to remedy matters, soon it'll be the men and women of England who'll draw the cart and the plow, and the horse and the ox will go free. Silence! Tell me, Tyler, where did you come by these opinions you hold? I've heard a priest himself say these things. Say on. What priest? The priest John Ball, my lord. And do you perchance know, Tyler, where resides your precious priest this moment? In Maidstone Jail, my lord. And you'll be keeping him company there along with this villain Jack Straw if you don't learn to know your place and hold your tongue. <laughs> while Parliament continued to increase the penalties and to devise new measures for the law's enforcement. A slow, sullen, savage anger grew in the people. And this anger of men outraged the boy king, the young Richard II, who wore gilded shoes and had thin ankles. This anger he could not fathom, else he would not have done what he did. But the country was at the fag end of a long and wasteful war with France. The coppers were empty, the royal jewels in pawn. Money had to be got from somewhere. So Richard listened to his advisers, Hales and Sudbury, and then lit a match to dry tinder. Hear ye, hear ye. Hard by the cross here on the village green, His Majesty's Commissioner of the Tax waits to read you a proclamation. <laughs> Listen well to the reading. Be it proclaimed in the name of His Royal Majesty, Richard II, that there shall be levied upon all lay persons in the realm above the age of 15, save beggars and fools, a head tax of three groats. <laughs> The levy was collected, the results reckoned. And the reckoning sends the king's treasurer, Sir Robert Hales, flying to his majesty. 
Richard sits at ease in his god, a falcon chained to his thin wrist. With him is his trusted advisor, the tired old Earl of Salisbury. What is it you wish, Sir Robert? Your Majesty will pardon the intrusion, but you must know at once that there has been a wholesale evasion of the head tax. Throughout the land, villages have concealed the existence of female dependents. One would think England were a nation of childless couples exclusively. You mean we have not taken in as much money as we expected? Exactly, sir. But you said the tax would solve everything, Sir Robert. You said the war with France could go on and that I should have my jewels out of pawn. Oh, what's to be done now? You tell me, old Salisbury. I should say, sire, that the only course seems to be to, to force collection. Precisely what I should advise, Your Majesty. Wring the money out of them. But won't they be angry with me? Oh, no, Your Majesty. As usual, the blame will fall upon myself, the treasurer. Oh. Already I'm told the priest John Ball has named me Hob the Robber. Hedge priests and Wycliffeites stirring up the people. What they need is a lesson to put them in their place. Your Majesty's lictor, John Lake, has proposed that he be sent with collectors into the counties to make a check on every household and punish defaulters. If you will sign this mandate, sire, he will be on his way tomorrow. And I shall have my jewels back? Yes, sire. Your jewels will be back in their place. And the people will be back in their place. So John Legg's men go out to wring money out of people already in want of bread. The rumor flies around that his collectors are abusing young girls. And the name of John Legg becomes a curse. And in the village of Dartmouth, where Watt Tyler is reported to have killed a collector, his name becomes a prayer. Watt Tyler, Watt Tyler, Watt Tyler, Watt Tyler, Watt Tyler, Watt Tyler, Watt Tyler. All over England, the people are strung tight as fiddle strings. They wait for a nod, a word. And the word comes from Maidstone Jail. A message from John Ball is smuggled out and circulated by members of the Great Society, a secret organization. At Dartford, Watt Tyler reads the message to the people. John the Shep greets you well. By John the Shep, John Ball means himself. And he bids John Nameless and John the Miller and John Cotter stand together in God's name and chastise Hob the Robber. Down with Hob the Robber. Down with Hob the Robber. And he bids you take with you John Truman and all his fellows... And look you sharp to one head and no more. Well, that's John Ball's message to you. But what does he mean for us to do? Resist. But how? how, you how we there is it? but one man wise enough to tell us what to do. And he lies in Maidstone Jail. Then we'll go to Maidstone Jail. We'll pull the jail down and have John Ball out. Aye, and the serf Jack Straw along with him. John Ball will tell us what to Aye, do. Aye, he'll Aye, tell us. He's, he's rung our run bell. Run he'll run tell run us run what run to run do. Run <laughs> You ask me, my fellows, to tell you what to do. For your hearts are light with hope, and your hands heavy with wrath. I say, let us all go together to our king and show him how we are in bondage and how we wish to be free. Show him how all men are sons of one man and one mother, begotten alike of the same earth. Show him how God has intended that no man shall reap the harvest for another while his own kind go hungry, but that he that sows shall reap, and he who builds a house shall dwell in it. Show him how on this earth man shall help man, and the saints in heaven shall be glad, because men no more fear each other, but live in fellowship. All this we shall say to our king in London. All the word is spoken. All over England, peasants leave the fields. Laborers put down their tools. In London, the boy king sleeps peacefully. Your Majesty, Your Majesty. His Majesty sleeps. Who is it? The Earl of Salisbury. Wake him at once. Let Salisbury come in. Your Majesty. What do you mean, old Salisbury, waking me up? Is London Bridge falling down? No, sire. 
But it will be pounded down if something is not done at once. <sighs> a courier has just come with word that a peasant army is advancing on us. An army of peasants? That fanatic priest, John Ball, and a laborer they call Watt the Tyler are leading them. Yes. Are they armed? They have no swords. They have a weapon more dangerous. Weapon? What weapon? An idea. The courier says they mean to have you free all the serfs. Free? Well, then they'd not be serfs. Impossible. Who'd do the work? Exactly, sir. They must be stopped, turned around. You must go to Blackheath, where they are encamped. I? Face that mob? You can do with them what you will. They will listen to you, the son of their beloved Black Prince. Show them that their interest lies with the crown and the established order. Go on, go on. What else? Turn them against their leaders. Show them that Ball and Tyler are traitors. Perhaps the mob itself will take care of them. and We will be saved the trouble. Good. Very good. And they say, old Salisbury, that you are dead and dug up. I am convinced, sire, that one man who believes in this fanatic doctrine of freedom is more dangerous to our security than all our enemies of Europe put together. Then, by gad, I'll go to Blackheath and put this nonsense down. Uh, help me out of bed, Salisbury, and call my lackey to dress me. <laughs> King is dressed, borne on a litter to the royal barge, and the barge moves gracefully down the Thames to the meadows of Blackheath, where the rebel army is encamped. To Blackheath, where young Richard, by the grace of God, King of England, hopes to hold back the flood tide of history with a frown. Jesu and Mary Salisbury, you said a thousand. There are ten thousand on that bank if there is one. Land, King Dick, land! That ruffian is Tyler, their leader. Oh, uh, no nearer, boatman. Take me no nearer to the bank. Courage, sire. We must stand up to him. King Dick! We want King Dick! Down with his dukes and lordlings! Down with you! Down with you! Salisbury! Stand up to them, eh, Salisbury? There is nothing to fear, sire. You are their monarch. Yours is the power. Power? What is power? I am king, yet a swordless army holds me at bay. Your power is tradition. Have not Englishmen been taught that God has given the king a divine right to rule them? And now a crazy priest is telling them that God has given them rights too. Land, king Dick, land! We would speak with you! Oh, uh, Salisbury, you speak to them. Tell them, tell them. Oh, heaven help me. Why was I born a king? I'll silence them, Your Majesty. Who are they to give you orders? Shoeless ruffians! If you wish to speak to your king, then go to your homes and attire yourselves fit to address the king. You call the shoeless ruffians, eh, Salisbury? Then answer me this. When Adam delved in East Fan, who was then the gentleman? Who was then the gentleman? Who was then the gentleman? Fool! Fool! You've overplayed the game, Salisbury! So the king's barge moves back up the river to London with more speed than grace this time. The king prepares to take refuge in the tower. And while his lackeys are scurrying back and forth with trunks full of his clothes and royal dishes and royal food, 10,000 peasant feet are hammering the road to London. By dark, the rebels are at London Bridge, but the bridge is shut in their faces. So they camp outside on St. Catherine's Hill, where the king can look down from the tower upon their bonfires and shudder. All night, the poor men and the laborers inside howl for the gates to be open and the peasants let in. And early in the morning, the king rubs his weary eyes and gives the order. Open the bridge, let them come in. And may God have mercy on us. The rebels swarm into the city. And the Lord Mayor of London hurries to the tower. Your Majesty, 
They've broke open the jail. Something must be done. Set all the prisoners free. Done at once, They've burned Lord. the temple. We must act. The laborers of London are rising against their masters. Where is our garrison? Where are the knights and retainers of our nobles? They have as much at stake as I. Your Majesty, in all we've been able to muster only 8,000 men. What is that number against this howling mob? Only you can shepherd them, sire. It is an audience with you they want. And if I give them an audience... I must give them what they want. Promise them anything, Your Majesty. Only get them out of London. We can think of ways to evade our promises. Trick them? We have good precedent for it. Remember John and the Magna Carta? Yes. But remember that the Magna Carta still stands. It was put in writing. Put nothing in writing, sire. Promise anything, but only with your lips. Once a thing is put in writing, then it becomes a fact. And the fact is hard to overcome. Oh, I will put nothing in writing, Salisbury. Nothing. All good men and true take heed and hear the words of the king. I, Richard, am king, and I will come forth and speak to my people man to man. Only the king! Therefore, move you out of London to Mile End like honest fellows. The king will ride out to you there and bring you banner. So the king and his company ride out through fields that are white with hawthorn and innocent with the English spring. Mile End is a playing field in an open meadow. His majesty's men draw up on one side and the peasant army on the other. And what the Tyler advances to meet Richard the king, man to man and face to face. The king wears ermine and the Tyler wears homespun. The king smells of perfume and the Tyler of sweat. They drink each other's health with bitter ale. Your health, sire. Yours. Uh, What is it you wish of me, Tyler? A simple thing, sire. Freedom. But you are free. You are a free laborer, not a serf. I'm called a free man, it is true. But it's also true that no man in England is really free, not even if he's called king, until every man is free. And if I do not choose to grant the freedom you ask? Then we will fight for it, sire. And if you lose? Better to be dead than live in bondage. You speak plainly. I'm a plain man. Yet I have been told you would like to be called King Watt and wear my shoes. I would change shoes with the lowest serf in England before I'd change with you, sire. Why, Tyler? Because power is poison to men's souls. Love of it caused even the angels to fall. And I'm no angel. Do we get our freedom, sire? Or do we fight for it? Hmm. You shall have your freedom. I promise it. Promises can be broken. We want it in writing, a charter for each county. I swear it. And so can oaths be broken. In writing or we fight. Uh, You... You shall have your freedom in writing. Then let your scrivener set it down. But from this day forward, serfdom is no more in England. That a man may go where he please, give service where he please, grind his corn where he please, marry off his daughter where he please, and pay no fines or harriets to any lord. Neither he nor his children nor his children's children, nor any coming after him, shall be slaves, bound to the soil. But that every man shall be his own master, and a free man. Thirty clerks burn candles through the night, putting the king's promises into writing. And for three days the men of England are free men, and there is great rejoicing. And it is Merry England, indeed. Hear ye, hear ye, all good.
good men and true. Richard the king has ordained that the men of England are their own masters and every man a free man. The temptation is strong to end the story here with ringing bells and bonfires and people rejoicing. But the tough and stubborn facts of history seldom fit the pattern of a storybook. When Richard rode home from Mile End, he found the heads of Hales the treasurer and Sudbury the chancellor grinning down at him from pikes above London Bridge. Part of Tyler's army who'd remained in London had had their vengeance on Hob the robber and the man who with him they held responsible for the head tax. And now Richard had the excuse he needed to repudiate the charters. Reaction set in. Wat Tyler was killed. John Ball hanged, drawn, and quartered. The peasant army scattered to the winds and 7,000 rebels executed. And the free men of England were serfs again. Serfs you are, and serfs you shall always be. You shall remain in bondage, not merely as before, but incomparably worse. <laughs> But because what was written in the charter was also written in men's minds, the battle was not really lost. The revolt of the peasants of England inspired the democratic movement throughout Europe and was the second great milestone, Magna Carta the first. Along the way we came. The things Watt Tyler fought for have long since been accomplished. Serfdom in England, along with the moat and drawbridge, have been relegated to the past. But the world is not yet caught up with the dream of John Ball. And men must fight again to the day for the world he envisioned 500 years ago. For as an English carpenter named William Morris, who built furniture and wrote words to last even longer than his furniture, has said, Men fight and lose the battle. And what they fought for comes about in spite of their defeat. And sometimes it is not what they meant. And other men must fight for what they meant under another name. NBC University of the Air has brought you Chapter 2 of the new historical series, We Came This Way. Next week, We Came This Way will present a story of the fight for freedom in Flanders in the 14th century. A handbook containing background information with suggestions for further reading is now in publication. We shall be happy to send you at cost this valuable We Came This Way handbook especially written for the current series. Send 25 cents to cover the cost of printing and mailing to We Came This Way, Post Office Box 30, Station J, New York 27, New York. Tonight's script was written by Frank Wells and directed by Ira Avery. The orchestra was conducted by Milton Catons. Members of the cast were Joe DeSantis, Owen Jordan, Don Morrison, Grace Keddy, Gregory Morton, Rod Hendrickson, Leo Haas, and Walter Epler. The narrator was John W. Vandercook. This is the National Broadcasting Company.